Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing a show that was actually recommended to us or requested by uh, of us by one of our patrons, Anton. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much we for the recommendation. You. We do. And um, that show is Right to Shelter or Housing. Yeah. Um, is, are either of those terms more correct? Um, I, th- I think they could be distinguishable. The United Nations likes shelter better. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Coconut Porter. From the Avery Brewing Company in Boulder, Colorado. I'm kind of excited about this one. Uh, I've been wanting to try this one for months, you know, and I'm, these were the last two bottles that they had at the store. I have uh, I, I've never worried. been a big fan of coconut, but I had a coconut porter the other night at the draft house that was really outstanding. So uh, I'm kind of looking coconut. forward to this. Like, I love coconut like basic bitches love pumpkin. Uh, uh, <laughs> Would you like me to pour yeah, your beer? Please, please. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, You're gonna ruminate on that. I am gonna ruminate on that. Well, that's that's why we have a. That's it's why like we have an excellent word. That's why we have a woman on the show is somebody can pour the drinks. That's the last drink I pour for you. <laughs> that is the last one. I love you, Anna. I thought it was so we didn't have to sit next to each other and and rub our weenuses together. <sighs> that that was a bonus point. Yeah. <laughs> oh Lord, Lord, Lord. John right, has been stuck so, on that word all day. So what do you we, mean? It's the first time I've used it. That's today. not true. No, it is. We are talking about. The right to housing today, or the right to shelter, um, and I guess I, I, I don't know what direction you were thinking, John, but I'm thinking I, I was thinking of, about coming kind of from a philosophical idea: is is there a right to, mm-hmm. to housing? Yeah, I think there, there's a little bit of legal stuff that we we had looked at earlier, um, but actually, uh, when Anton brought up the show, he it, it was kind of uh, him requesting that we expand upon a, a previous show we'd done, which is uh, positive and negative rights, and just kind of yeah. focusing on one. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think there's there's a lot of, of philosophical uh, musing to be done about this because uh, it, it's kind of one of those things that. Uh, a little bit newer, I would think. I mean, do you- uh, well, the, the terminology is newer. Uh, okay. The terminology is kind of a 20th century th- uh, concept, but the idea is not there. You know, we we had um, think about in the 17, 1800s, there were workhouses, there were mm-hmm. almshouses, there were these ideas that the cities uh, w- would would provide a place for uh, for for the indigent. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, if you look back. The people that tended to be in those houses, those, those situations, were overwhelmingly the elderly. Mm-hmm. If you go to these kind of places today, there's almost no elderly there. It's all young. It's all young. And, and part of the reason why is because as a, as, a, uh, as a people, as a state, at least in the United States, we have, we have kind of changed our focus. And we determined in the 1930s that we were going to create a safety net for the elderly, and we did with the Social mm-hmm. Security program. In, in England, they did it with the pension program. Mm-hmm. Um, Australia has a pension program. Um, and that has kind of, kind of taken care of a lot of that for the elderly. But we don't have that for the young. So let me ask you, um, in these houses, you say it used to be elderly, and now it's, it's almost all young people. Is that because the elderly aren't there? So there's... All around less people, but the, the the ratio is different. Or has the change actually driven more young people into it? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't know what the answer to that is. I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to find out about it. But uh, but the, the the concept is not new. Yeah. The language, I think, is new. Yeah. I want to ask one more question on on that. Uh, Do you think, uh, uh, I guess more from a philosophical perspective, that there's a preferred, uh, uh, if you have to have the young there or the old there, there's a preferred kind of... Yeah, I, I I think it's easier for us as a people to uh, to to look at the at, at the young and say it's your fault. It's mm-hmm. it you know you know you're 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 young. You're capable of doing this. You should be taking care of yourself. It's your responsibility. Well, these older people, we look at them. We go, you know what? You've paid your debt. You've d- done your time. You've paid into this for so long. We should take care of you. Mm-hmm. Now, whether that's correct or not, mm-hmm. I think as a society, that's that's what we're seeing. Yeah. Um, just kind of spitballing ideas. Out, yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, it, but it's, it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we 
don't do anymore that we used to do. We don't have all those workhouses in the cities. We don't have orphanages anymore. Uh, for the most part, you know, not not like we did. Not okay, like we, fine. Not yeah. like we did. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not Annie with all the kids living mm-hmm. in the uh, in, in the house. That was a common thing at one point. Uh, we have something quite a bit different now. We 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 don't have uh, uh, the, the public housing that we have is a lot different, mm-hmm. particularly in in America. It it's it's hard to qualify for public housing now. Yeah, there's 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 qualification standards there. I was listening to a a, a show from a. Uh, a YouTube video from the uh, repertoire of, of housing for you, you know, the United Nations. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about how when she was a uh, she was an assistant to a member of parliament when she was living in England. And she's an American. Mm-hmm. She was there studying abroad and she got got a job doing this and said that uh, somebody came to her and, and her job was to help the constituency. And this this family came and said, "I've been I've been evicted from my house. What do I do?" And she said, "I I don't know." And she went to the prime minister and said, "What do I do?" He said, "It's not a problem at all. You just go put them up in a, uh, you know, find them a a, a a hotel or a bed and find them a spot, put them up. The state will pay for it, and we'll put them on a list. And when that's done, we'll we'll get them in housing." Mm-hmm. And there was no there was no uh, means testing for it. It was just you have a right to a house, so hmm. we're going to we're going to provide this for you. Uh, now it wasn't a great house, but but. That government had determined that that was a priority to them. They had a priority to man should take care of their fellow man, and it should be the state that does it. You know, and, and I, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, I kind of like that better than what we have here. If, if you know, we are to determine that a right to housing is a thing. Um, so one of the videos I was looking at uh, was talking about uh, within the context of a right to housing, uh ways you can't discriminate as a landlord against you yeah. know who your tenants are based on sexual orientation, religion, uh, ethnicity, on and on and on. But one of the things I found really interesting, because I'm actually in the process of getting an apartment and moving and, and finding housing, is that uh, they said you, you cannot discriminate on economic basis uh, except for, are they able to pay for the house? Is yes, there as, enough money to make, make the payment? Yeah, yeah, and if if they can qualify for that, then you can't uh, uh, base it on their means. And there's only limited stuff you can do with their credit history. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was really interesting because they seem to be looking at that fact, at least in America, only from one side, only to say you can't be too poor to have housing. But we found uh, really interesting. There was an apartment complex we were actually really interested in, but it was only, uh, was it Section 13? Is that what they call it? Section 8. Section 8 housing. So, uh, and... and it was sh- income-based housing yeah, for was, anybody outside of Texas. Yeah. So it was income-based housing. Um, and I, I, I make enough money. I, I really shouldn't be on income-based housing and wouldn't have qualified. Uh, but I was more than willing to pay the full price because I, I like the apartments, I like the location. But I was not able to get into the yeah. house because I made too much money. And that was actually a, a fairly common thing we ran into in yeah. various apartments we were looking at. And so in, in that way, we were kind of discriminated against in the housing for having too much money. Yeah, yeah. I really wanted it, in that fucking school district. Yeah. It, it's still it's still a form of discrimination. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it, it's... A form of discrimination that I think is harder to make an argument for. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's but, more accepted. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, well, but, because you have the means to have other choices. Well, that's, that, that's the thought here is the thought is, look, these are reserved for those people that cannot have what you can have anyway. Yeah. But, but isn't it really, when you look at it, kind of a separate but equal? Because what, what they're saying is, they're saying, this is the housing for people who can afford it. This is the housing for people who can't. And there's even some mixed housing where if you qualify, you can get uh, income-based apartments. But if you don't, they can have both. So... And the whole go- and the whole program is funded by the government. The government m- meets the the difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. So why wouldn't it be that um, I can live in any of the houses, uh, but if I don't qualify for this program, where government pays eighty percent of my house or fifty percent or whatever the number is, then I can just excuse me pay the full rate. Yeah. Well, because there's a limited number of those houses, and there's more people trying to get in them than there are, so that they have to do a means testing program. If you're going to have a program like this that is means tested, you have to have that limitation, or you have to make everything's means tested. But but the the, the means testing and the funding don't seem to be tied 
to like any kind of it's only it's only this type of house you live in um, because while they do have apartments there that are put aside for it, there's other apartments that are mixed, right? Yeah. So if it's going to be the government will cover 50% of your housing if you make less than this, then why can't the program just be you can go to any apartment anywhere and, qual- and, and, and apply for this program? Like, why does it matter um, – where the government's sending the check if they're sent to this apartment complex or that. Does that, that make sense? That sounds like a very British concept of, of the system yeah. they use. It doesn't matter. We'll we'll get you a, put them up somewhere and and we'll take care of it. Yeah, yeah a little, a, quite a bit different. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, the United States has uh, has one of the highest homelessness problems in the industrialized world. Uh, I, you know, and, and I knew I knew we had homeless, in, uh, but. I wasn't aware of how broad it was, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's really interesting, some of the laws we have that prevent citizens from fixing some of those problems. Laws against feeding the homeless, laws against, you know, where you can shelter them. and it, you know. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've got some interesting laws. Uh, what I found interesting going through this, though, is, is you know, in my uh, my little lizard brain here, uh, I guess I've, I've, I've watched too many uh, too many reruns of Annie and Oliver Twist, but I've got this image of... of of the homeless as being an urban problem Mm -hmm. and and it's not an urban problem Mm -hmm. it's an everywhere problem yeah yeah. there's a massive problem with 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 uh with adequate shelter in uh you know in in rural america Mm -hmm. that there's not enough homes for uh um for, for for these people well one of the crazy parts about that is that in rural america we have so much space for so many more homes we do now that's because, you know, one family or one person will own a hundred acres and put one house on it. But we do have, it's not that we don't have the space for them. Whereas in um, urban areas, you you have an amount of housing. housing and there is stiff competition to get that housing. Yeah. And, but- and I'm not saying that they don't have enough space for it, but... It seems like it shouldn't be as much of a problem in rural America. I, I don't think it's a problem of uh, available housing. I think no. it's a problem of available uh, housing that you can afford. Available. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, the, 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 there's there's a lot of houses sitting empty. Yeah. The, the, awesome. the problem really arises if you look at it from an economic perspective that you have a person for whatever reason, whether it's something to do with their mental health or some situation they found themselves in or, or mountainous debt, whatever the situation is, that they cannot produce enough uh, uh, utility for them to own a house. A house has more utility than they can produce, so they cannot afford to buy it wherever that is. And, and you know, like I said, there's various reasons why people get into these situations, uh, not at all necessarily making them a bad or useless person, but once you get into it, 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 it becomes this, this economic scheme of, okay, you can no longer produce enough to sustain yourself, at least on a housing level. Maybe food you can uh, so how do we fix this imbalance that you've found yourself in where you, you aren't, the value you produce isn't worth economically, at least, uh, the, the space that you need to live, Yeah, you know, uh, and, 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 and then the question is, is it the responsibility of the state to do that? Yeah. You know, because, uh, I, I think we can all sit here and say that, that it's the, it, you know, it's the responsibility of society to do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. But is it the responsibility of the state to do well, it? Well, and I think then you have to ask the question of whether, um, whether society and the state are something inherently different. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think there are uh, groups think, of people who would argue that society equals the state. Yeah, those, those, I, I would completely disagree yeah, with those people. But, but, I, I, but, I, but I understand the logic. I understand yeah. where they come from. Let's talk a little bit about, about on the international scale here because uh, the United Nations has identified the right to adequate housing as a natural right. Okay. They, they identify it as one of those rights that you are born with, and, and everybody has a right to that. Uh, I, I, I want to hear what they have to say and why they're just fine. It, but at current, just hearing that, I think that is a gross abuse of the term natural right. Well, Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, uh, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including 
food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the term natural right, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think first coined by John Locke, is that mm-hmm. correct? Uh, well, popularized by John Locke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, means the rights that any man would have... Uh, in nature, in a unencumbered. State of nature. Yeah. yeah, if he's on a desert island by himself, what can he do? He has the right to move freely. He has the right to, you know, go harvest food, or he has the anything you could do on a desert island with no one else stopping you. That's what the term natural rights means. So I can't. Now we may argue it's a right, and that's a different argument. But to say it's a natural right, I, I really don't see how. How well, I mean, maybe well, the right to build shelter. Well, here you know, here, here's. T- I think right we're to getting, space to put shelter. We're getting into yeah. a vocab, vocabulary or terminology situation yeah. here because uh, one of the things that's happened in the last 30 years or so is the term natural right and human right have become interchanged. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you read anything from the United Nations, they'll, they'll say natural right in one place and human right in a, another, and they interchange all these. Mm-hmm. In this case, they said that it's a, it, it is a human right. I think human right might be something that, that, that makes a little more sense. Yes, um, yes. Uh, but still... Is, do you have a right to shelter? Do you have a right to housing? Uh, and, and maybe shelter is a better better term. Um, you mentioned John Locke. Mm-hmm. John Locke said uh, that man has three natural rights, mm-hmm. and he defined those as life, liberty, and property. Mm-hmm. Thomas Jefferson is going to come through with the declaration, and he's going to paraphrase that as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm-hmm. But the original phrasing is life, liberty, and and property. Mm-hmm. If that is what you accepted, does that equate to a right to adequate housing? Yeah, I, I think I, I think it does. Except, I'm going to define the term differently than I think a lot of people who use this will, um, and that is to say that I think you have the right to not be encumbered in your pursuit of housing, right? That, that the government shouldn't be able to come in and take your house down. Or if somebody's trying to provide you housing, shouldn't be able to stop them providing you with housing or food. You know, we talked about the, the laws for feeding the homeless. Um, but, uh, you know, and th- this gets into our show on positive and negative rights, you know. Uh, a positive right, and, uh, you know, just to define uh, real quick for those who may, may have not heard the show, uh, 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 a positive right is a right to which you are entitled to a thing, like the government gives you a thing. A negative right is something where it says the government can't take a thing away from you. Yeah. So th- that's the difference there. Uh, but a positive right necessarily, uh, I can't think of any examples that don't, but maybe there's some weird oddball in there, but necessarily has a uh, encumbrance on a negative right later because the only means through which government has to give someone something is to take it from someone else. So to give you a positive right to item X is to uh, take away someone's negative right to not have their item X taken away. It's redistribution. When given to you. So, um, you know, the, the natural extension in this conversation when we talk about a right to housing in the context of a positive right uh, is to say that the that you don't have the right to have your whether it's wealth and they build a house or they directly take your housing or land you don't have the right to not have that taken away from you to be given to someone else. So uh, I find it interesting that you that you took this over to positive and negative rights because as we're talking about John Locke versus Thomas Jefferson, I think that's the argument that's there. Mm-hmm. I think you have a positive right when you say life, liberty, and property as a positive right to that. But it's a negative right whenever it's changed to pursuit of happiness, right? So I, well, I don't I, think so, no. Yeah, I, mean, I think Locke is saying you can't have your life taken away, you can't have your liberty taken away, and you can't have your property taken away. Not that the government has to give you life, has to give yeah. you... Okay, well... I, 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 Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I, I guess I'm looking at it saying Locke says you have a right to property. Jefferson says you have a right to pursue property. Yeah, and I think property yeah. can be framed as both a positive or negative right. Yeah. Uh, you know... They have to give you, uh, 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 you know, 10 acres and a mule. That's a positive right versus you have the right to go buy whatever property you have and the government can't take that away. That's a negative right. And those are both property rights, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, Interesting way to look at things, though. Um, in the United States, we have 
we, we, we have lagged behind a lot of the Western world in this idea of, of, of you have a right to, to housing. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, we, we largely, uh, largely don't think that, that people have a right. right to housing. Now, mm-hmm. we do have a government that says that we'll help you if you need it. Yes. But, but, but very, very strict requirements on this. The rest of the world kind of thinks we're, we're, we're cold and heartless for this. Backwards. We're, we're very backwards compared to the rest of the world on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I don't... I don't know that we're wrong in it. I look at it and I and, and I I don't believe personally that you have a right mm-hmm. to housing. I don't believe anybody has a right to housing. I do think it's okay to say that that I would like people to have an expectation of housing. There's a difference there to me. And that's because I believe that society should be providing housing for people. Mm-hmm. By you and I, and, and, and as, as as people in our churches and our youth groups and our uh, our charity, we should be providing housing, and we should we should should not be happy when people are, are don't have a housing house. But I don't think you have a right protected by the state to it. Well, and and I think there there is one little sliver where I I, I think we're going to disagree on this, uh, but but we'll find out where I think you 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 gain a little bit of a positive right to housing. And that's the, the commons, when we talk about the commons, um, which is basically things owned generally by the government. You can think of the commons as a park. You can talk about, a, 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 you know... A national park system. National park system, uh, any Government of that. land. Yeah, any of that. And I think uh, uh, land in the commons, I, I think you should have a right to go live in the commons if you want to live in the commons. Now, most people don't want to live in the commons. That's kind of where they end up if they, you know, don't have somewhere else to live. Well, you know, we, 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 we did for a long time. We, we you know, and, and still, there's, the Homestead Act is still out. You can yes. still homestead. Yeah. If you want to go live, at, live with the jackrabbits in West Texas, you can still homestead on some of this land. Yeah, well, and, and it, not, not even just homesteading, but I think there has been a movement away from the commons idea, which is really interesting to me at the same time that we are asserting that people have this positive right to own things we're also we're also ta- saying that the government is not society it's its own entity mm-hmm. and taking away the commons uh, we're seeing uh, 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 city ordinances not allowing people to not own a house which is a weird concept to me uh, we're seeing okay, so say that again not allowing people to not own, to be homeless not allowing yeah. people to not own a house okay um, so it, it it's criminal to be homeless like people are just like going out saying screw my house I want to be homeless you know yeah. um, uh, we are vagrancy laws yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're putting up uh, things that make it hard for people to sleep under bridges we're putting up little spikes so people yeah. can't lay down yeah. uh, we're, we're building special park benches so people can't sleep on them and we are taking the commons and making them as inhospitable uh, inhospitable to the people who need it as we possibly can and yeah. and uh, I, I and do. all because we don't like the way that it looks because it makes people with homes uncomfortable and it does and it and it and it yeah. and it it lowers and it property should. values, and it does all kinds of things. I mean, it I, should make them uncomfortable. But 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 would you argue that a, that a city doesn't have a right to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Really? really, I think it's an asshole thing to do. But I think they have a right to do well, it. Well, I I think that depends. Do they own that land, or is that land in the commons? If it's a municipality, the, the municipality should be able to vote for their own laws, right? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I don't, I, 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 mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm spitballing. So, here. so I, I see what you're saying, and I, I, I think there, there's a place where, where, where government theory diverges from philosophy, and I'm kind of talking the philosophy side. But on a the government theory side, I think you're absolutely correct. They can. Uh, I'm kind of more arguing a state should be able to vote for its own laws. And sometimes those laws include genocide, and I say, no, I don't think a state should be able to vote for that. But on a government theory side, they can and they do. You well, know what I'm well, saying? Does that uh, make uh, sense? But, uh, okay, a state can, a state or a municipal, anything can create its own laws so long as it's not violating the rights of someone else. Well, those rights are, if for, like, for instance, for us, are listed in the Constitution. Yeah, but do you have a right to sleep on a park bench? Okay, but but what I'm saying is, a different state could not put those rights in the Constitution. That's true. So That's then true. those wouldn't be rights to that state. And yeah, we they, have to understand that as a natural right, as something that that, that, that we all have. Yeah. And I'm, th- th- I guess that's where I come back to. Do you have a natural right to sleep on a park bench? I think if it's in the commons, yeah. Okay. All right. That's interesting. I, if you would define that as a common area. Okay. Um, well, and I, I think that 
the issue there really comes into is the park owned by the city. Um, and if it is owned by the city, then it's not in the commons. Well, no, but I think it is because that city is funded by society's tax dollars that they're all putting in. That That is a commonly and, well, owned... Well, and I get know. that. I, uh, I understand what you're saying there. And I think what I'm probably trying to reference here is more the psychology of it. Um, we have very much acted in a way, and as long as I can remember, and even looking back, it, it seems that we have been thinking of government as its own entity in and of itself and not really a, uh, a coming together of the people for ages. Yeah. And, and so we've been treating it as though, uh, like corporations are people. We've been treating the government like an individual and that it owns those things and that those things are not actually in the commons. I yeah. think our so, definition of the commons is different. Uh, and and, and that, that's where I run into this is because to me, the commons is an area that is set aside for the common use of the people. And, you know, um, you know, if, 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 if there's a, if there's a natural lake that's always been used by the people and the people have been drawing water from it forever, that's a commons area. And, mm -hmm. and you can't then come through and, and say, you can't use this because it's commons. But if, a you know, if, if I decide to build a, a, build a gated community and say that homeless people can't live in it, that's not a commons that's area. That's fine. Yeah, right. that's absolutely fine. Yeah. But because it, it, most of those are privately owned, uh, proper, managed property. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I would even say a, if, if that gated community that uh, came through and said, uh, and we're going to have a park here, that's fine. But, but that's normally when those kind of things is not supported by tax dollars. Well, but but we've already said that these areas aren't commons for, uh, in, in a lot of ways by saying the park closes at nine o'clock. Yeah, you can't use it after that. So there's rules there. I the, agree. Uh, you know, it, it, well, that rules this, enacted by the owner of the property. Yeah, which which is that that it's not a commons area at that point. Mm -hmm. it's, this is an area that, that we've put out there, and it's it's an area owned by the city that is utilized for these purposes. Oh, That's I, not yeah. commons anymore. I, no. I'm not disagreeing that we currently mistreat the rules. I, I, I completely, I just don't. I don't think you mistreat the rules. I think that's what the rules say. Right. Now, do I think they're good rules? Maybe not, but but it's not a, it's, it's not an abuse of the rules. It's the rules. But I, I mean, we, so what we did is, is, is we said it would be nice if there was a place where people could go and look at ducks you know, whatever, and sit at a bench and spin on a, you know, merry-go-round. And so we taxed people. Uh -huh. We took all the money and we said, this is the people's area to look at ducks, sit on benches and, and use a merry-go-round. And and then we've, we've kind of come through um, and said, except you, you can't uh, fall asleep here because, you know, somebody may not be able to appreciate ducks as much if there's... Uh, yeah, well, you know. I, but, but, but that was the purpose of it, okay? If a city buys an area and says, I'm establishing this as a park, and I want it for the people and I don't want it to be a homeless area, that it was never a commons area. It was established as a park from the beginning, and this is the purpose of it. Now, again... If they were to come through the state forest that's that, that's open to everybody to come through and camping and all this, and all of a sudden say you can't camp in the state forest, well, that's different because that's been a common area for a long time. It's it, There's a tradition of commonness. It's not the same thing as I'm buying this land and I don't want homelessness on it. Okay, but, okay. So many, uh, so let, let, let's go with that, right? So many of these parks where they have the rules about homelessness, traditionally, if you look back, didn't have those rules. These are newer rules put in place. So we've still gone back to we had an area where homeless people slept and we made a new rule. So what's the difference in making a new rule for the forest or I making a new rule I for I think the it's always been a rule in most of these places. I mean, uh, it, it's just a matter of whether they're enforcing it or not. Now, again, I'm not saying that it's a good rule. I think there should be better system letting people sleep in a park. If you're letting them sleep in a park, you're doing you're, you're already yeah, you you're already screwing, up. screwing yeah. up. But but again, I I think the argument you're making is not a logical argument. In my mind, I'm yeah. not seeing the logic here because I the, the city owns it. The city gets to make the rules for that. So what in your mind is the logical difference in why they can't make a rule that the homeless can't live in a forest, which has happened in places. In fact, there was one who was recently yeah. shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and why the city can make the rule they can't. Like, where is the logical line of why think, one's different? I think there's than a the tradition other. there that these that these these state forested areas, these state properties, have a tradition of homestead. They have a tradition of people doing this, uh, and 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 it's something that that has happened over a long time. And there's common law that happens there. I think if a city in, incorporates and they say this is what this is what the people of this area have decided they're going to do with this, it's a different situation. Incorporated versus unincorporated. There's a lot of it. Okay, I, I mean, I, I, I think, I think, I think when we make that argument. Uh, we get into two uh, shaky places. One, we're kicking the can down the road. We're just saying, no, no, no. It's just the fact that's a city government versus a state government. Which, now, you, I, 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 okay, yeah. maybe, maybe. I, I don't um, see it that way, but I, I see where you're coming from. And, and the other thing is, when we talk about tradition, uh, traditions are just a change that happened at one point and hasn't changed for a long time. Sure, sure. So, but that's how our system works is on precedent. So, right, right. But but a tradition is always have to change because it was a change that made it a tradition sure, in abs- the first place. Absolutely it is. So. Uh, absolutely it is. But but that 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 would be done through interestingly enough, that would be done through a vote of the people saying that it's okay to do this when Right now, you're arguing that a vote of the people saying it's not okay isn't, isn't justified. So why is it? Why is a vote of the people saying we can't have homeless homelessness uh, in our area wrong, but a vote of the people saying that you can okay? Well, I I, I think from a government theory standpoint, it is completely within the realm of government to do such. Uh, my argument uh, from the philosophical side of it is that if, you know. Whether or not taxation is good at all, but more importantly, that you are taxing people for, for for to pay for land that they do not have the use and enjoyment of. I think it's a violation of property. Okay, okay, I can see that. I can see that. You want to talk about this beer? Yeah. What do we drink? We <laughs> we are drinking coconut porter. All right, this is Avery Brewing Company in Boulder, Colorado. ABV on this. Uh, I don't know. Ten point eight. You or me, John, because she's already called not yet. <laughs> I'll go for it. Okay. This is this is a good beer. Mm-hmm. Um, do we? Do you know how much this costs when we got it? No, because I'm, I'm thinking it's it's a good. I know beer. it was over twenty dollars for the two. Okay, yeah, so about ten dollars a bomber. Okay, that it is a good beer if I if I rank it across all beers. Mm-hmm. It's not a particularly impressive bomber beer for for what we usually get in bombers it, it's it's okay um it it's definitely got some coconut flavor but it, it it's a it's a rather dull coconut flavor it's like you get the coconut and there's no complexity in there there's nothing else it's like they took and brewed a porter and threw some coconut in there and called it a day i mean they didn't really do a whole lot with it it's it's clearly been um uh fermented for quite a while to get to a 10.8 um there may be a little bit of vanilla a little bit of a woody taste but it's 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 not i'm, I'm not tasting a lot of complexity yeah. all that said i'm gonna give it a three it, it, it tastes good um but it, it's it's barely getting to three for me yeah yeah that I, I, I i think you're in the right ballpark um i i I think it's a decent beer. I'm not a big coconut guy. I mm-hmm. uh, had one the other day that was great. And if I compare this with the one, I've forgotten what it was that the uh, that the local draft house had that was so good. I don't even remember. But it, uh, uh, this doesn't even compare with the one that we had there uh, to me. This is... Uh, I wish I'd had that one. I like the smoothness of the coconut. It gives it a little bit of creaminess in there mm-hmm. that, that, that that's good. Uh, there's not a lot of bitters to it. I think it's a good beer i don't think it's a great beer i i just read something i want to see yeah. if, if you because i didn't pick this up at all in the flavor profile yeah. this is a bourbon barrel aged beer is it really did you get I'm, that at no, all I'm getting no no, nothing yeah. bourbon in this so but the uh um uh, i i think you're in the ballpark i'm gonna go yeah. a little lower than you i'm gonna go two eight okay all right um so i i actually um so i, I had just picked it up and read it because i thought it tasted uh aged not necessarily one of the best bourbon barrel aged beers that i've had um but there is the woodiness Mm -hmm. to it that and i think that's where that's coming from but i do really like that flavor with the kind of creamy coconut flavor that you're getting um i've really enjoyed it it's a little stout for what i want this morning Mm -hmm. like like (laughs) that that abv is a little higher than i would have liked. I would have honestly gone for a session ale today. Yeah. 
<laughs> but um, all in all, I have enjoyed it. I haven't been downing it the way that I would uh if I was in the mood for yeah, a high I, ABV beer, I, I, we I, may have all partied last I, night. I, I wonder. I wonder little. if I hadn't been out last night a little late, if if this wouldn't have gotten a little higher rating from yeah. me. But you, uh, you know, and, and that's part of the reason I did bump up to a three. But even you know, just being completely objective on tasting it, it that complexity. I mean, it's 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 a dull beer to me. It's not exciting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like it a lot, um, but I do think that it could. I think that it could be a little bit smoother. The coconut uh, flavor could be a little bit richer. Um, and while the woodiness tastes really good, I do think that it overpowers some of the the more traditional smoky notes that you get in a porter. Um, and so with that, it gets a 3.3. I think there are things that it could do to be exceptional. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I did mention it, I got the last two bottles that they had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do wonder if it's been sitting on the shelf for a little while. Um, I don't think I was able to, f- I look, I'm pretty sure I looked for a date on them and wasn't able to find anything. 1993. There we oh, go. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the, uh, Avery Brewing Company was established. Uh, Thank you. This was the first bottle they made. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but anyway, um, so I wonder if it might be better out of a tap uh, fresh off the line, yeah, if it maybe. might be creamier and, and those notes be more of what we're looking Avery for. Avery does a pretty good job, though. They do, it? and they're it's not a, a bad yeah, brewery. Yeah. I'm not trying and to And it's not them. a bad beer. It's a, yeah. it's a good beer, and that's why it gets a 3.3 from yeah. me, but I do think there are steps that can be taken to just push this over the you top. Know, I, I'm in this weird place where, you know, our we were from a 2.8 to a 3.3 three here, yeah. which is all pretty pretty broad broad scope there when you think about it. And and I, I'm listening to it, and I can't argue with any of the ratings. I, I listen to yeah. it, and I go, yeah, I can see where that could come from. So yeah. yeah. It just, which is really, really kind it's of odd. Fucking first. Uh, oh, shit. The hell up <laughs> God. So we're going to play our game? Yeah, oh, yeah, right. sure. I Let's almost play forgot about the game. Um, will it get you laid? <sighs> Maybe. Uh, is that a Cosby beer? It is pushing up on a Cosby beer. Like I think it's there. Be careful with that for sure. Yeah, it's um, definitely a Cosby beer. Definitely. Yeah. So don't don't use a whole lot of it because you don't want to you don't want to go into Cosby territory at all. Yeah. Um, that, Pack uh, some pudding. <laughs> <laughs> there right. are things that can mean, and you should not. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway well if you um, drink enough of this you might well yeah you might okay. but anyway so it's maybe if you're really trying to impress somebody and get in their panties uh, there are better options than this yeah, yeah this is a pretty good one though I think yeah. so alright yeah I'm gonna put this as a flex beer uh, I, I don't I would not Hail Mary with this thing um, and you know I could I could bring it out on a special night but it wouldn't be my first choice uh, but I don't. I don't. I think it's a, a fairly safe choice, and I, I think you know, if if you have it stored away, and something comes up, and you don't want to make a run to the store, I think this will pretty much work in any situation. But it's not going to be great at any of them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not a lawnmower beer. This is this is to me more of a uh, you know a, a a cool fall night kind of beer. Uh, yeah. You know when you're when you're sitting outside with your with your buddies around a. Uh, you know, around a fire or something, shooting the shit. This would be a good beer for that. That being said, this being a flex beer, and with such a high ABV and being an aged beer, this would be a good one to just keep around the house. The boss shows up, and y'all are all hanging out. You grab, I mean, you can grab a bottle and just have this, and it's its going to keep for a you good while. get him drunk and ask for a raise. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, it all you works know. out. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. All right, so that was a, it's probably like a nine on Beer Advocate. But, oh, uh, sure. What do you... Let's get back into this, John. What you, where, where are we going next on here? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, we, we kind of need to talk about where it, you know, how much of a positive right is it? Because we've kind of been dancing uh, around the issue, I, th- I think, a lot on, on the commons. And, yeah. and I think we're all pretty much in agreement on... Um, the government shouldn't be able to take your housing away, your yeah. access to housing. All, all, you know, maybe we can call yeah. it. Uh, but what should the government be giving you in in way of housing? Yeah, um, that, that that's that's terrifying to me. Uh, I I I tend to to instinctively say the government shouldn't be giving you anything. Mm-hmm. They should be protecting your right to access to something. They should not be providing it to you. Uh, you know, you know, which to me means that that, that uh, 
I, I don't have a problem with the government saying uh, that, that you can't uh, be discriminated against for housing. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with the government saying you can't be evicted without cause. Mm-hmm. I do have a problem with the government saying that, that's, that you have to be given somebody else's property. You know what's really interesting to me on this? Uh, something that I think the government could and should do, and I would have no problem with. Um, I've seen I've seen various versions of this, you know, all all across the country. But we, but I'll, I'll use our local example. We have a program here with our water bill, where you can uh, pay extra on your water bill, and it will go to this organization called Keep Jacksonville Beautiful that plants flowers and tries to push through status laws. Um, So, uh, and then when I was in, uh, when I was in Natchez, we had one where you could uh, donate to the volunteer fire department. Yeah. But what I've, I've never really seen is one where you could donate to provide homeless shelters, you know? And I think that would be a great use. That'd be an interesting way to do things, you know, provide. Oh, yeah. Put so much more money on something and it goes towards getting somebody else a house. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, um, I'd participate in that. Hell Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that's a great use of government resources. They're already communicating with these people and have a monetary exchange anyway. Why not say, and you can throw a dollar on and, and, and help uh, prevent homelessness. Homelessness is one of these really weird things where it's not a sexy issue to try and raise money for. But nobody but likes it when there's n- nobody likes it when it's and a problem, it, and it's entirely curable. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it's absolutely curable. Um, my big problem with talking about an affirmative, a positive right to, to housing is the fact that that it necessarily requires that you come in and take money from other people. It requires force. Yeah, you 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 take the money from them and then give it to somebody else, and and we have seen. In this country, where taking that money can create more homeless people because they can't afford their house anymore because they're now helping to pay for this other guy's house. Yeah, I get where you're going there. But honestly, like, of all of the, the government programs that exist, I would totally... I'm going to, like, get crucified by libertarians here. But if I'm, if I'm making choices, there are, like, a no less than a dozen government programs I'm happy to shut down oh, yeah. and, and funnel that so that taxes aren't actually being increased and people aren't further being displaced from their homes. Yeah, ending homelessness is like really low on my list of things to get rid of. Yeah, you know? so like as, as in my uh, ideal world, we approach uh, true libertarian utopia like... That's one of the last things to go as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. mm. you know, cut a bunch of other stuff. I yeah. don't think that the solution, and I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. I don't think the solution necessarily has to involve taking more than is already being taken. Though I do believe that what is being taken shouldn't be let, being let, taken. Let me ask you something, because there's a theory out there that's uh, that has a lot of evidence behind it. That that if you, if you look at statistics, homelessness kind of uh, skyrocketed in the 1980s. In the uh, in the United States, and that uh, coincided with the Reagan era cuts mm-hmm. in mental health uh, uh, for mental health hospitals and, and and so forth. And the theory out there is that what this did is it it, it took a, a a way where people could get care, mm-hmm. and it made them homeless. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I actually tend to agree with that. I, I never heard that before, but one of the things I've said for years, I'm sure Anna's heard it more times than she cares to uh, recant, but when you're homeless, it is not actually a problem with you being poor. There is something more fundamentally there because the amount of mo- of wealth you have to generate to get a home is so small. I mean, we look at it and say uh, uh, housing costs are so expensive, but mostly when we're talking about, we're talking about the house we want. Nice housing, not yeah. the house we need. Yeah, you can get a, you can get a cheap shelter, fairly affordable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so it it doesn't cost that much. It usually has something more systematic to do with how they're living their life. Now, it may be I've seen homeless people who prefer to be homeless. Yeah. They prefer that freedom. Uh, I've also seen people who. For whatever reason, and I think at this point it almost has to be mental health, have no interest in saving any kind of money. In fact, uh, there was a famous Howard Stern bit where they did a homeless Jeopardy, and they brought in a bunch of homeless people, and one of them got something crazy like $10,000. 
right? If, and they took the person who won, gave them the money, and then followed them around and saw what they did. The guy went out, got the nicest hotel room he could think of, got a Rolex, drank fine wine, and did and just like blew the money in a day or so. And they asked him, they said, why would you... I mean, you could have gone and gotten home. Why did you do this? He goes, yeah, but now I get to say I spent a night in this nice hotel and got to eat a steak and had a Rolex. I'll have that story forever. So, I, and and it, it's it's almost universally a systematic problem yeah. that needs to be addressed. So when you say that the systematic uh, 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 the system of fixing people's mental health was taken away and homelessness increased, that makes perfect sense to yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, there, and there's a lot of evidence that supports that. There's yeah. people that disagree with it, of mm-hmm. course, but uh, I just at least want to address that that they coincide mm-hmm. whether yeah. I, I that, you know it doesn't necessarily mean that's what caused it but right it, but you know there, there's something there most homelessness where where you see someone say yeah i was homeless in college for a while or i was homeless during this or whatever is very short-lived it, it, you know it's, it's like something happened they lost other money and you're able to bounce back from that very quickly um, and, and to me, while that is technically homelessness, I don't think of that when I think of homelessness. I think of long-term homelessness um, as being a, a bigger problem. I don't, you know, honestly, if somebody is homeless for a couple weeks or a month on a very short term, something happened. I mean, that's not ideal. I would like to see them not be that way, but I don't really see that as a big societal issue. You know, I had a buddy uh, when I was senior in high school that uh Got into falling out with his family and got kicked out of the house, yeah. and and he was living on the streets, you know, just just couch surfing from house to house yeah. for about six months, and then he realized that he just couldn't do that anymore. He joined the Navy, and you know now he's a retired Navy guy, did real well, but he was homeless for a little while. Yeah, uh, I've got another friend that that's probably on the homeless homeless list roster somewhere, a buddy of mine from the Marine Corps, who doesn't own a home. He uh, he he lives in hotels, but he just he he's got a car or, or truck and full of tools, and he just travels from disaster area to disaster area fixing stuff. That's that's his life. He's chosen to be homeless. Yeah. So some of these numbers. I don't think it's a large percentage, but there is a percentage that chooses this life. Well, and neither of them were shelterless. No, they 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 found Which, a way to shelter. I think it's sig- significantly different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, but that, that's something else we have to think about. As uh, you know, there is a degree of uh, my, my brain is not working for what what the word I'm looking for is. But there, there there's something we have to consider about ourselves here. If tomorrow, any one of us found ourselves, you know, uh, without a house for some reason. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be on the streets tomorrow. No. If I didn't have a house tomorrow, y'all would put me on your couch. Absolutely, or I have yeah. a friend that would put me on the couch. Or uh, my parents would help me. Or, you know. But there are people that don't have that ability. They don't have those people that, that, that can do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if, if my house burned to the ground tomorrow, I've got a credit card and I could, have a, I, I could go live in a, in a hotel for a few weeks if I needed to. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's things that we can do. Everybody can't do that. Yeah. And I would like to dive into the, you know, do a deep dive, maybe not on the show, but at some point, just for my own interest, do a deep dive into someone's life who doesn't have that and find out how they got through life and then develop those relationships. Credit, I understand. Maybe you're bad with money or whatever, but then develop what in their life kind of led them to that place. Because to me, so many of those relationships I developed, I wouldn't go around saying, yeah, if I'm homeless, I'm going to need to find somewhere to live. So I, I need to be friends with Mike, right? Yeah. It just, just through the course of living and meeting people, those things develop. So what was so different in your life that that never happened? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And, and you know, maybe it's, maybe it's because, you know, you weren't from that area. You've moved to an area, you lost your job. Now you don't have, a, you can't afford to get back. You know, there's, there's things that could happen. Yeah. yeah well, I'm, so a great example on that. Uh, uh, Philip DeFranco actually um, had a had a homeless stint. Uh, he he was living at home with his father, and he he had a, a broken home, so he bounced back and forth between living with his mother and father. I think he he left his mother after she got an abusive. Uh, uh, guy she was with and so he's living with his dad in Florida and he's doing really poor in college he's not actually going to class because he's he's making YouTube videos instead which I'm sure his dad was <laughs> thrilled about um, now it probably turns out kind of worked out for yeah, him it kind of worked out for him but during this whole thing he ends up meeting this girl online and dating her and she's she's a dancer and she has this nice place in in New York and continues to talk to her and and he, she says, why don't you come move in with me? And he grabs all his stuff and the last bit of money he has, 
packs it all in a car and drives up to New York. And he's like, all right, I'm here. Well, the first night, well, I'm actually out with friends. So, you know, I can't, we can't meet him. And he's like, okay, cool. Well, he sleeps in his truck the night and the next day he gets on. Okay. So where am I going to meet you? And this like continues for two more days. And he's like, what the heck? I've driven all the way to, to New York. What's going on? This girl lives in LA, doesn't even live out there, was making up this false profile and, and he, he got completely catfished. And now he's in New York with no money in a car with all this stuff and and so when that kind of stuff happens uh, i can i can understand it but we even see with him he very quickly ends up you know bouncing out of that situation finding his way back and it 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 it, i can understand that but that that's again goes back to that short-term homelessness i'm talking about what what gets me is if i'm homeless for six months in dallas and i have no friends up there and nobody who i can reach out to I can make it back to Jacksonville in six months if I'm not doing anything but holding my thumb out. Yeah. I can just walk to Jacksonville walking. in six months, you yeah. know. Yeah. So I just I don't understand how you get stuck in there for long periods of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well and I would actually like to see the numbers. And and I don't know that you can really even get any reliable numbers on this, but I would like to see the numbers on out of all of the people at a given time who are homeless, um, who have been homeless for more than six months. Right. Um, because I suspect that a significant portion of a homeless population in a given area is in that, that fairly temporary situation. Yeah. Um, and that just by the, the very nature of people not actively observing them um they're just seeing homeless people they're not seeing a particular person um that it seems a lot more chronic than it is well and and you know i've i've seen these specials not that that makes it any better and you can even see them in in dallas as you're driving under the uh the the freeways um but they have like homeless camps where people have tents set up and everything and to me, when I see somebody and you see people walking around with shopping carts and they got all these blankets, they have developed systems to live in that environment. And to me, those people have become a weird kind of institutionalized to that life. Um, and it, it's at that point when you become institutionalized to homelessness that I really start to wonder, like, what's really going on here? You know, I'd like to you talk about not being able to see the numbers. I'd like to find some way to figure out what real homeless numbers are, because yeah. Think about how how do you count people that are that are homeless over yeah, years? Exactly. How do you well, ha, you know if when if, authority if, people uh, if they don't have a house, if they're not them. paying taxes, if they're uh, you know they're, they're they don't have a public they don't have a utility bill. How do you even know? Well, and when people of authority approach them, they rightfully avoid them. Yeah, you know because of vagrancy laws in a lot of places. Yeah, um, you know so even if you were to just walk the streets and identify them, you're not going to, I think, get quality information from that. I think there's also a really interesting question with these these institutionalized homeless people uh, on, on what the right to adequate shelter means. Because if I take some tents and a set of little campfire and I go one of these tech, state national forests and I just live out there and I live out there for a year, do I have adequate shelter? Oh, the number of cases of evictions of that kind of stuff is amazing. Mm-hmm. People, that, even living on their own property that choose to live that way, are forced out of their out of it because oh, you're yeah. not living according to uh, the community standards. Yeah, so I yeah, mean, organizations like Keep Jacksonville Beautiful push ordinances state that make laws, that laws or statist yeah. laws. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. push ordinances that make that illegal. Yeah. yeah, and if if I want to live in a camping type environment, uh, I I feed myself. Uh, I keep the rain off my back for the most part, except when I want to be in the rain. I keep myself warm at night with a campfire. If if that is is how I'm living, is that then adequate shelter? Is that adequate? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, adequate to you? Yeah. We we recently saw a case where uh, this this couple had I don't remember like eight kids, and they were all taken away from them because they were living in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the couple, as well as the children, adamantly protested that that's the way they wanted to live. Did they live in a, a, a sheltered, adequate shelter? I had you know? students one time who, who 
we we didn't find out till later, but they spent two weeks living in a car because they were homeless and yeah. nobody knew because the yeah. parents the kids always came to school clean somehow they found a way yeah uh, well me and me and my dad uh lived in a car for a week now it was more of a vacation thing where we wanted to travel around the country on a road trip kind of thing but yeah i had a, a gym membership to uh a, a branch of gym that that's all over the country and we'd stop into a gym every once in a while and and take showers and you know we we yeah, found ways, find ways trucker stops uh yep. we actually paid to get a shower at a trucker stop at one point but yeah we we just we but we were for all intent and purpose voluntarily homeless i mean we yeah. had a home back in texas but we were yeah. we're up in, in in the northeast watching you were experiencing the eclipse it, yeah yeah northwest sorry but yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah it's interesting to me have we uh have we covered this uh yeah i think we probably have um I know we, we kind of got off rights there at the end and just kind of talked about homelessness in general. Do we want to uh, do we want to uh, talk any any about our patron's uh, organization that he had there? Just out of curiosity? Oh yes, we absolutely yeah. do, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to forget. Uh, uh, wanna, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I want to call it a plug, but uh, but uh, well, I want to talk about it a little bit because I really it seems like to have a solution. I like the ap- approach that he's taking. I do too. Because one of the things that uh, he's trying to do with this organization is to overcome people's fear about what happens when they just give a homeless person money. Yeah. Um, because there is there is the pervasive idea that if you give them cash, that they're going to go and spend it on drugs. And some are. Some are, like, no doubt. But um, it is because of that that a lot of people justify not helping. So one of the things that his program does... Um, is they give uh, they give homeless people food vouchers, haircut vouchers. Uh, they help them find employment, socks and underwear. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I want to say he's calling it basic needs or necessi- basic necessities, maybe um, not bare necessities because that the would be funny. Bare necessities. <laughs> um, but so he's trying to find a way that people can feel comfortable giving and maybe even giving much larger amounts than they would have if they were going to give in cash. Um, because now they're able to specifically direct what that money is going to go toward. Yeah. Um, and I feel like he's trying to, I feel like what his organization is doing is, is, is it's giving people their dignity back. To yeah, an absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the things he he talks a yeah. lot about is is trying to make it so that these people can live a dignified yeah. life. And what I like about it is it's it's a, a it's a group of people that have chosen to, it's society yeah. that's chosen to do it, not the state. Yeah, um, nobody's forced to give money. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's all voluntary. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think one of the crucial things with with homelessness is, um, and I haven't been there since I was a toddler so I don't remember that but um yeah. but so I haven't been there but I feel like probably one of the things that contributes to chronic homelessness is feeling like you aren't worth it um and so I think doing things like being able to eat a good meal being able to get your hair cut getting help finding a job are the sorts of things that help you get out of that funk of not feeling dignified, not feeling worth it, and being able to then say, you know what, I'm cleaned up, I've got some skills, I've got a, a interview set up, yep. and, and I've been coached on how to interact with this interview, and I know that if I get this job, I've got a place that I can go and get cleaned up at and well, whatever, and I think that can help just giving them that dignity can help them get out of that situation. What was the name of that organization? I, oh, uh, it is. I, I can't right have a hard time reading here. that little print. It's Northwest Hospitality. It's in uh, Washington. Yeah. And so it is It is a very regional organization. Uh, their website is just freaking left. Uh, nwhospitality.org. Yep. Uh, so if anybody listening wants to check them out in, in a little more detail or even wants to contribute, you can do that there. Now, I'm sure there's organizations like this all over the place. But, there but, but, are. But research them. Make sure that you're, you know, you're, you're going to a good place. Yeah. You know, well, and, go ahead. Um, so there's also one of the places in the U.S. with the worst homelessness problem is Los Angeles. Um, and there's an organization that I, I actually recently found out about called Food on Foot that is 
totally private funded. Um, they, they don't accept, they don't get any government money to do this. Um, and they do a lot of the same sorts of things, um, you know, getting people cleaned up and fed and kind of getting their basic necessities met um, to help them get back on their feet. And in fact, um, the guy who is, he's hes not at the very top, but there's uh, one of their main spokespeople who um, has been with this organization from very early on, was actually homeless in Los Angeles for a really long time. Um, and, you know, he talks about going from, oh crap, I forgot the area that he was in. It doesn't matter. Going from basically just the worst of the worst. And, and now he, um, is, he's gotten himself a decent job and he's living in Beverly Hills now. Um, not off the money from this organization. That's a different thing. (laughs) Just so we're clear, he has a, a, job and he volunteers with the organization. But, um, one of the things that I do want to do, so I really do hope you guys will check out our website for this post is I want to find some organizations like that, that are kind of regional, see if I can get seven or eight. Um, and I'm going to do the research, but I, I want anybody who's looking at these to do the research yourself and make sure that because just because they meet my values doesn't necessarily mean, mean that they're going to meet yours. But I want to see if I can get seven or eight that'll kind of cover the whole U.S. and put links to them so that uh, you can help with this problem in your area. So something interesting you mentioned earlier that, that you know a lot of people are hesitant to give money to these people because they're worried they're going to spend on drugs or mismanage the funds, right. which I think is, is, is kind of a found of fear because, like I said, I believe that most people are in these issues. The problem is systematic. It's it's not due to an, an instant. Um, it, it's interesting to me that, they, that a lot of them, when you talk to them, they say, I don't want to give them money because they'll spend on drugs and they should go find a job. Mm-hmm. But I'm sorry, what are the, you know, if you want to uh, per push someone's drug habit, one of the worst things you can give a crackhead is a job. <laughs> They'll go work their ass off and go get cracked, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to say that um, uh, uh, derogatory. I mean, good people have, have problems yeah, with, yeah. with addiction. But the, the point is uh, the, the fact that you're giving the, the money. Uh, yeah, having uh, a job doesn't immediately just make your addiction Exactly, go away. exactly. So, you know, go in and get that job. And now, not only do they have money, they have a reliable, steady stream of money. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm, yeah. I'm one of those guys that would much rather give somebody uh, a product than money. Oh, and I agree. And I also agree that I'd rather give them a job uh, where, they, where they can start to climb yeah. that ladder yeah. than, than give them money given that option however the the fear that if i give them money they will buy drugs is it's unfounded because yeah, exactly either way you're you're you know if you help them get a haircut they've got a better chance of getting a job and they're going to buy drugs so right. you know, if, I mean, if they've got a drug problem they're going to get drugs the, yeah. the fact of them being poor and the fact of them being a drug addict need to be addressed separately as each its agreed. own issue agreed you know yeah yeah and as it doesn't apply to everybody. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Well, this has been interesting. I'm sure glad he uh, he brought this up. because I don't think I would have thought of it on my own. So, yeah, actually. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of an interesting topic. A little off where we do, do sometimes. So yeah, I kind I of enjoyed it. it. Yeah, a little yeah. more philo- philosophy in this one. So anyway, um, we hope you guys have enjoyed it. Um, if you want to support the show, you can hit us up on patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Um, we have swag at teespring.com slash stores slash six pack philosophy, all spelled out just like on Patreon. And you can hit us up on social media, just search six pack philosophy and you'll find us there. Otherwise, uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun and we hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 